And welcome to you all who are joining today, the African Forum on Green Economy, Investing in Natural Capital for a Resilient Africa. Um, we'll just give it the obligatory minute to allow others to join um, and to make their connections onto the Zoom today. And if you're just joining us now, we'll just give it a little bit more time to allow others to connect, and then we'll get started with the webinar. So I think it's time to start now. So um, welcome everyone uh, to the African Forum on Green Economy, uh, investing in natural capital for a resilient Africa. Um, thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all safe and well. Um, a lot of you will be aware that uh, this was planned to be a face-to-face -face event in Kampala, um, but obviously due to uh, COVID-19, we've moved this on to an online event. And we've been having some amazing sessions over the last uh, couple of months now. This is the fifth topic that we're going to be covering um, and is one that is extremely important. And to be honest, um, all of the assessments and work that we've seen going on around the world, the one thing we can guarantee is that people will come back to us at some point and say, the problem is data, okay? And that's always an underlying issue. What they mean by data is very difficult to understand and it often means lots of different things, but it's often a phrase that's being used around natural capital assessments, around understanding change and transformation. So this is gonna be an extremely important topic and we've got a wonderful panel to talk through this and to help us to understand really what it means to you, what it means to Africa, and how we can make improvements with the flow of data. So if we can move on to the next slide, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background. So this is a, a forum that's going to be looking at how green economy and natural capital connect and how both of these are needed if we're going to have a transformation of the system and support the economy that we all want. Now, first of all, just to give you a little bit of background to what these things mean. The green economy is a, a way of believing, uh, the, the belief that we have, that we can achieve a sustainable, inclusive economy which supports prosperity for everyone. And it's important thinking about that prosperity for everyone. It's in, this requires not just um, obviously economics, but also society and the environment as well, and thriving together through a, a policy which is inclusive. It's about redistributing natural, physical, and financial wealth. And it's a phrase that's being used all around the world and Uganda being one of the places which is really championing. Um, if you want to find out more about this, then the best source for this is the Green Economy Coalition, and I would highly recommend going to their website. If we can move on to the next slide. Um, there's also natural capital, um, and natural capital um, is the stock of resources that deliver a flow of benefits to people. So it's the benefits that we receive from nature. Um, for all this, there's lots of organizations around the world and the best source for going to um, information around this is the Natural Capital Coalition, or more recently, what we've done is we've united the Natural Capital Coalition and the Social and Human Capital Coalition to create the capitals work. And this is looking at an inclusive approach that connects both nature and people and becomes even more important when we're trying to build out green economies here as well. This program of work has been delivered by a group of organizations coming together. Um, a lot of them you will have seen on earlier slides, but both the Green Economy Coalition, the Natural Capital Coalition, the Global Green Growth Knowledge Platform and WWF have been leading a program of work, Economics um, for Nature, um, with many other local partners as well. And if we can go into the last slide um, for me, Hannah. So what we're trying to do here is three things. We're trying to promote understanding we're trying to connect stakeholders for the long term here, not just through these webinars. And we're also looking to commit to action. And I'm very pleased to say that already we've got lots of bilateral conversations and other work coming out of these webinars. And we hope that today will also lead to even more um, opportunities for you to work with others on these important topics. I'm now gonna pass over to um, Evelyn, who's going to run us through um, the uh, program today, introduce all of our speakers, so over to you, Evelyn. Thank you.
Evelyn, I think you're on mute still. Um, one of the joys of these webinars. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for the introduction and a very, very warm welcome to you all. My name is Evelyn Atuhaire. I'm an economist with the Ministry of Water and Environment and in Uganda and facilitator for the Technical Working Group for the Uganda Natural Capital Accounting Program supported by the Waves World Bank. Thank you for making time to join us for the, in this fifth session of the Africa Forum on Green Economy. As Alia mentioned, the theme for today's session is data for decision making. And the topic is how can we best apply natural capital accounting and uh, data to unlock green economic opportunities. We have four excellent speakers with us today. Uh, Dr. Athen Sanon from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Burkina Faso. Uh, Mr. Kagwa Ronald, National Planning Authority, Uganda. Ms. Erika Troja from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research. And Philippe Pudaho from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Switzerland. We will hear from each of them and some introductory perspectives about their work and their experience, in, uh, their experience on how they think data can be better used to unlock green economic opportunities. Thereafter, we will have an open discussion with you all. A bit of guidance on the practical aspects of the meeting to help us have an interactive discussion and maximize the time we have. Kindly use the Q&A button to type your questions to the speakers at any point. We will answer them at the end. The Q&A button is at the right hand side corner of your screen. You will automatically be muted, which means we cannot hear you. If you have something to say, please click raise your hand. If you want to share a general comment, you can have a conversation in the chat dialog box. I ask our four speakers to limit their remarks between six and eight minutes maximum so as to have enough time for the discussion and wrap up in the hour planned for the meeting. We will start with Mr. Kagwa Ronald from Uganda. Since 2015, Ronald has been working at Uganda National Planning Authority as head of production, trade and tourism planning. In this role, he has coordinated the development of the Uganda Green Growth Development Strategy, sector strategic plans, and was a member of the national team and the pilot water accounts, the Uganda World Bank Waves Partnership, and the Uganda UNEP WCMC Biodiversity Accounting Program. Ronald has also participated in the formu formulating and implementing of Uganda Vision 2040, the three national development plans, and various sector policies and strategic plans, as well as numerous international in initiatives such as Rio Plus 20, negotiations, open working discussions on uh, sustainable development goals, various conferences of parties on biodiversity, and international meetings on green economy and natural capital accounting. I'll now turn the floor over to Ronald. Ronald, I think you're on mute. Thank you, Evelyn, for that generous introduction distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Um, allow me first of all to give the context of uh, and rationale for information and data on natural capital. Um, if I look at Uganda, ours is a natural resource-based economy. We depend on natural capital for employment, economic growth, our exports, and all that. Therefore, it's critical that we manage this natural capital very well for the employment of our people and the earning of foreign exchange. We're also um, working from a context where the demand for natural capital is increasing. Now, where the demand for natural capital is increasing, it's also uh, amidst rising degradation. And these have got implications on livelihoods, the security, 
economic growth. And there is also a threat that the envisaged social economic transformation may be threatened if natural capital is not managed very well. Uganda is also a vulnerable economy, vulnerable to many shocks, natural shocks, the climate change, and now the COVID-19 shock. The question is, how do we build a resilient economy that can withstand the shocks? Um, again, much as we rely on natural capital, there is use of prices and market prices here, markets, to move or to based on our decisions. Decision making is based on market prices and these are market-based decisions. But as you may know, many natural resources do not have market prices. Ecosystem services do not have market prices. They are therefore left out in a market-based decision-making process. And um, as you are again aware, in this Ugandan country, that we are living in a complex environment where there are so many competing decisions, many competing demands on natural resources. The need for trade-offs to be made and trade-offs require proper analysis, proper data, if we are to make you know, um, meaningful trade-offs. We are also committed to many international and regional agreements, the IT targets, the SDGs, the national targets, the Vision 2040, the development plan, all these require data. So we are living in a world which requires a lot of data and this data is not easy you know, to come by. Therefore, to make a strategic decisions, to make a good planning, we need data at all levels, at all levels of natural resource management. And therefore, there is an urgent need for reliable data to support natural resource planning and decision making. Allow me, uh, Evelyn, to introduce you to, uh, to some of the works which Uganda is carrying out at the moment. One of the key deliverables that Uganda has made recently is the National Development Plan, NDP3, and its result and monitoring frameworks. Now, this plan is to be launched on 1st July this year, when the new financial year begins. The focus of NDP3 is sustainable industrialization. Industrialization which is based on natural resources. Now the question is, do we have enough resources to sustain the industrialization drive? So what investments do we need to make in natural capital, human capital, and produced capital to see that the development plan is implemented? Again, through uh, different partnerships, we are developing fisheries, land degradation and tourism accounts with the support from UNEP, um, WCMC under the Darwin Initiative. This initiative is to bring a lot of good information data, which will be critical to decision making. We also have the WEBS partnership supported by the World Bank, through which we are developing land, forests, wetland and the forest ecosystem accounts. Again, these will keep, give two, I mean, a lot of data that will support decision making. Uganda also carries out bio, 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 uh, biomass studies. This is done by the National uh, Forest Authority and this produces a lot of information on the trends of our forest resources and other uh, resources. So, we have accomplished many works and some of these are our recent accomplishments. We launched the Uganda National Capital Accounting Program in 2019, that was launched. The water accounts are being finalized with support from UNSD. The experimental sum accounts were done in 2017 and this was done with the support from UNEP WCMC. The land and physical asset accounts were launched in September 2019. These were done by uh, WEBS program. The forest accounts are being prepared. And uh, we also have a national plan for advancing environmental economic accounting, which was launched in 2019. And many other supportive studies were done, for example, macroeconomic indicators, 
to support and inform the national development plan process. So there are quite a number of uh, activities that are going on, which will enrich the decision-making process and which will, leave, uh, will give us a lot of data. Maybe another issue that I want to look at, Evelyn and the colleagues, is how can we, uh, how can natural capital data be used for decision making in Africa and Uganda here in particular? It's critical for tracking the changing trends of natural capital stocks and flows. Natural capital is changing and we need to track this change. And using time series data, we can track this change. Changes in forests. We can also identify the major drivers of this change. And this information is critical for identifying the trade-offs and then inform win-win policies that we can design and also inform investment and business decisions, both by the public and the private sectors. Now, NDP3 looks at sustainability indicators. We are looking at, is our natural capital changing? How is it changing? We have forest indicators, sustainability indicators, wetland indicators, and these are monitored in our reporting frameworks. And I'm uh, sad to report that we're not doing very well on sustainability indicators. This is where Uganda's performance is poor. We are losing the forest cover, we are losing the wetland cover. So this is again very, very critical in informing policies. We are also using um, many economic instruments fees, charges, taxes on natural resources, subsidies and there, and these the enforcement mechanisms. So natural capital data can inform what taxes do we levy? What fees do we levy? How do we use the fee? Okay. And um, um, what, what are the returns on investment? We are living in a very constrained you know, environment. Fiscal space is low. So we need to put our resources where the returns are high. Again, we are looking at this data to guide investment decisions to where returns are high. I'll give you an example. Tourism is the leading foreign exchange earner for Uganda. The returns per unit investment in tourism is very high compared to other investments. So using this data, we can identify returns on investment and therefore guide you know, decision making and investment decisions. Supporting evidence-based planning, sector planning, um, we can build scenarios using data, and this can inform our decision making. A key issue that we have looked at, that we have seen, is how do we share data? It is a challenge of sharing data at the national level and international levels. One thing that I want to say in Uganda here, we are moving towards institutionalization of natural capital data collection and analysis. We are moving towards having institutions with um, units which collect the data as part of their mandates, having manpower that looks at data, statistical data. The Uganda Bureau of Statistics is one of them. The NFA, the National Forest Authority is one of them. We're also forming working groups, natural capital partnership, the forum, like this forum that we are on, the African Forum on Green Economy. These are very good opportunities where we can share data. We have also established partnerships with producers of capital of, of data, users of data, and especially the policy application of data. So these opportunities, we are exploiting them. And uh, these are bearing some fruits in sharing the highest cost, but sought after uh, natural capital data. Even now, allow me to stop here for the time being. I'll come in as required. I thank you, colleagues, for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ronald, and thank you for very much for the points that you have shared. Uh, our dear audience, if you've just joined in, we've had, we've list, we've had from uh, Mr. Kagwa Ronald from the National Planning Authority, Uganda. And among okay. the things he has spoken about is uh, how data, how natural capital data can be used. And some of the things he has pointed out is it is critical for tracking uh, trends of stocks and flows, critical for informing policies and, and, and policy indicators, 
data can be used to inform physical instruments, um, to be used on natural resources, and it can also be used for everyday best planning and guiding investment. Oh, not just next. And... Next, yeah. we shall hear from uh, Dr. Asen Sanon from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Burkina Faso. Asen is an engineer in agronomy. He holds a PhD in environmental sciences and has previously worked as a researcher on soil health and sustainable agricultural system development. In 2011, Asen joined IUCN in Ugadugu, Burkina Faso. Since 2019, Asen has coordinated an EU-funded project dealing with governance of protected areas in West Africa. This four-year project embraces several dimensions of biodiversity and protected areas in West, protected areas governance in West Africa. This includes establishing regional capacity on natural capital accounting as a way to support decision-making processes in countries who depend on natural capital for their development. Asen is also the acting regional coordinator for the Protected Areas and Biodiversity Program of IUCN, PACO. Asen, over to you. Thank you, Evelyn. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to participate to this panel and share with you some insights emanating from a couple of initiatives dealing with capacity and knowledge development we are dealing currently at uh, IUCN PACO to support decision-making and action. <clears throat> Next slide, please. As it is a common practice, gross domestic product generally measures a country's economic performance. However, this indicator looks at only one part of economic performance that is income, but says nothing about wealth and assets that underlies this income and has a consequence, nothing above the longer term sustainability of current growth patterns. Wealth accounting, including natural capital accounting, is inevitably needed to sustain growth. The issue is especially important in developing countries depending on natural capital for up to 47% of their wealth as per a World Bank publication on 2018. Next slide, please. Very quickly, uh, the NCA model we are using in the Futajalon landscape then the Futajalon is a transboundary area between the Republic of Guinea and Senegal in West Africa. Then this model quantifies the capability of the ecosystem, which includes ecosystem productivity and ecosystem health. And thus determines the stock and natural flows in three domains that are ecosystem carbon account, ecosystem water account, and the ecosystem infrastructure account. The model will also be extended to additional landscape in West Africa to extend the scope of our work. Next slide, please. On this slide, we have the preliminary result of the Futajanon landscape. The ecosystem carbon account and ecosystem infrastructure account are presented here. Note that these results are preliminary and still need to be confirmed by local experts. But in the meantime, on the left side, you can see the first result on the carbon stock in the region from 2000 to 2015. And on the right side, you can see the first result of the net landscape ecosystem potential account in the Futajalon landscape. This infrastructure account will further be extended with metrics like biodiversity measurements at both species and biotope level, intoxication by chemicals, and population health. Next slide, please. But the important 
and challenging dimension of our work at IUCN PACO is that our initiatives go beyond the establishment of, in, of only natural capital accounts and embraces a more integrated model based on cross-sectoral approach, mixing up multidimensional expertise. Indeed, our intervention concurrently includes measuring and monitoring of protected areas performance to also generate data that will go to feed a regional reference information system. Importantly, a couple of regional observatories are also in development through our undergoing initiatives to constitute ultimate receptacles of the data. And at the same moment we develop the tools, we also intend to establish a regional capability through capacity development of the users to allow them appropriately perform and handle the data generation process. In addition to this, we aim at setting, setting up a sort of regional multi-stakeholder body that will gather expertise on biodiversity conservation and sustainable, uh, sustainable development from West Africa. And this body will be in charge of translating data and information emanated from the project in knowledge and messages that will present more chance to be audible by decision and policymaker. Because one thing is to produce data, the other thing is to use, to be able to use them. And uh, to fully ensure the buy-in and ownership of this knowledge and information in the region and incentivize informed decision and policy making, we foresee a couple of activities, including first, the development and adoption by ECOWAS state member of a regional framework that will facilitate biodiversity and protected area mainstreaming into regional sectoral plans, strategies, and policies. And also, we aim, we will facilitate the participation of decision and policymakers to important conferences all around the world dealing with conservation and sustainable development issues to popularize findings and key messages from West African region and incentivize further pro-conservation pledges. We anticipate that all these initiatives will help contribute to the broader objective of transitioning towards a green economy and achieving sustainable development. Next slide, please. In conclusion, allow me to share some insights and few challenges that emerge from our work. First of all, credible and accurate data must be ideally, must be available ideally through open sources. This is a critical aspect towards information and knowledge generation and should determine both the quality and quantity of dimensions that the natural capital accounts could capture. Equally, availability of local competencies to handle the process is vital and will determine the prosperity of the concept. Second, Data generation in support to decision making and policy making should be perceived as a cross sectoral collaboration. And such an approach should give additional chance to capture the multidimensional facets of nature. And to finish, let me say that it is still a need of demonstration of the relevance of the concept to decision and policy makers, as well as to businesses contributing to nature depletion. It is therefore of critical importance to come out with audible knowledge and information to incentivize toward a green economy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aston, Sanon. Um, thank you for the presentation and the notes you've just shared with us. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you just joined us, uh, we have had, we have so far listened to two speakers. That is uh, Mr. Kagwa Ronald from the National Planning Authority, Uganda, 
and Dr. Asen Sanon from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Burkina Faso. And thank you panelists for keeping time. Um, we shall now look at ecosystem services assessments in Africa and Central Asia. She is currently scientific advisor to the GIZ UFZ Green Value Initiative, implementing three case studies in Africa where natural capital perspective on conservation areas is applied to local and regional decision making. Uh, so you will please speak. I would encourage our, our audience in case you have questions, please use the question uh, tab at the right hand side corner of your screen uh, to share with us. Over to you, Uruke. Hey. Hello, everybody. Thanks for the invitation. I hope you can hear and see me all right because I don't really hear and uh, see anything. Um, I'm uh, today speaking um, on behalf of the Green Value Initiative. As Evelyn pointed out, it was commissioned by the Federal German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development and is executed by GIZ with scientific and technical support of uh, the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, UFZ. And the initiative uh, seeks to highlight the value of conservation areas for development and prosperity in Africa, applying a natural capital perspective. Um, we advocate for a paradigm shift that, ad that combines biodiversity conservation and development. Um, the green, oh, next slide please. The, the Green Value Initiative um, focuses on conservation areas in Africa and takes a uh, two-tiered approach. On the one hand, there's a continent-wide report based on available data sets um, and then a set of six case studies uh, focusing on six specific conservation areas uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Madagascar, in Morocco, Mauritania, DRC, and Ethiopia. Um, especially for the uh, continent-wide report, but also for the, uh, the case studies, we pragmatically combine available data um, with the application um, of then an ecosystem services natural capital perspective to value the natural capital um, of conservation area, highlight interlinkages and identify trade-offs uh, for conservation and development that come with different uses and then uh, in order to contribute to uh, hopefully an increasing acceptance for protected area for, uh, for development. We work with partners and local stakeholders in landscapes where these conservation areas exist. So that participatory approach is one uh, that in the case studies we uh, really focus on. And we um, seek to inform a problem situation or a specific decision uh, process. So this is why this first scoping phase of really understanding, um, you know, what is the problem? What is the context? What are the social um, uh, constraints uh, in an area? And then elaborating that into a research question um, takes a lot of time um, and then determines also uh, the search for data. Um, I have brought you two examples, um, both based uh, uh, around hydropower, which doesn't mean that we focus on hydropower, um, but uh, I think to show a little bit the difference between the continent-wide report and the case studies. So next slide, please. Um, so um, African countries have a very high demand uh, for energy that still needs to be met, and hydropower is a promising uh, source uh, since it's stable and also renewable. Um, and in the continent-wide report, we uh, combined different data sets uh, and found that already 19 African countries rely on hydropower for more than 50% of their total electricity production, with three of them exceeding that share to even 80%, which doesn't mean that this is enough. So there is, uh, as I said, um, more energy demands to be met in the future. Um, for hydropower, conservation areas um, are important because they keep hydrological systems um, intact. They effectively reduce soil erosion. And since sedimentation due to soil erosion is the one big factor which determines uh, a dam's lifespan, it is important to think about upstream uh, soil protection and uh, reduction of soil erosion. So um, you see here this example, um, so I just 
took out one um, where um, we narrowed in a little bit on Kenya, but also on other countries um, where we overlapped um, African hydropower reservoirs as they stand today with their watersheds and hydrologies, and then um, looking at uh, conservation areas in that region. And as you uh, see here uh, for Kenya, it's about 25% of the watersheds that feed into dams are protected are protected in one case, even none. Um, however, um, for countries um, with significant hydropower uh, capacity, sufficient watershed protection is critical for the overall um, energy security. So the description that we are uh, making here with uh, data with numbers, we hope um, can leverage a debate uh, for responsible expansion of hydropower paired with watershed protection measures, um, where multiple co-benefits that arise um, from electricity production on the one hand and um, conservation on the other hand can then be brought into the debate as well and uh, possibly um, add to that argument. Um, next slide, please. The, um, the other example, um, focusing on one of the case studies is, uh, is the Lomami National Park in DRC. Um, one of the main problems of that protected areas is local ownership. It's a fairly new park. Um, and the development needs in that region are extremely high. So LSC, uh, electricity production could be one of the activities uh, reconciliating conservation activities and development, since electricity is an important element to enable people to participate in social life, take ownership, um, starting, for example, with cornerstones such as uh, education and e-education in, uh, in remote areas uh, um, such as uh, around the Lomami National Park. So um, the provisioning and regulating functions of the national parks for hydropower facilities can be strengthened and explained and uh, integrating that function of the park into development planning and the national parks uh, public outreach can possibly increase acceptance of the park and raise local ownership. So what we've done in our field work is um, uh, in uh, village focus groups, we ask participants to identify small scale hydropower sites based on gradient and falls, um, where then possibly uh, within a development planning process, uh, small uh, hydropower plants uh, could be established. Uh, second, we, a literature review uh, revealed that hydropower sites um, are already identified uh, in the north of the park with a bigger potential um, um, uh, megawatt wise by expert opinion. And then still remaining as an assessment of two existing dams that are on the frontier uh, with the park and the landscape. So while we're currently validating the results with our local and national stakeholders in, um, uh, in DRC, we hope that one of the outcomes uh, of, these, of this data, um, of uh, this uh, yeah, numbers, um, could actually lead to formulation of a narrative um, that goes as such that electricity isn't an important input for development. Hydropower is a stable and clean source for electricity. So, but hydropower also needs watershed protection, thus effective conservation measures via the national park in this case. Um, so these are two examples. I would like to leave you with um, three uh, points in the end. Um, first of all, data itself is not enough. I guess most of you uh, know this and uh, we already heard about this uh, as well. Um, the um, multiple international and continent-wide reports have shown that protecting natural capital is important. This alone does not trigger sufficient action though to, um, to, to protect it. Second, natural capital assessments provide important figures, but they need to be more strongly reviewed and communicated in the light of development decisions. And this includes questions of distribution of equity. And it might maybe 
need to go as far as to debating what prosperity means for a group of people, for a society um, in a political dialogue. And third, I think, and uh, also uh, Arsene uh, touched upon that, I think we really need to strengthen the ability to understand data and interpret it in the light of sociopolitical contexts and power plays. So how can we make numbers and dependencies more relevant for political discussions, also in questions of communicative capacities and networks? Okay, this is why I would like to stop. Thank you. Thank you, Uruka. And those are brilliant insights and examples you've shared there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we'll move on to our next speaker, um, Philip Fuidaho. Uh, is an environment, is a conservation economist and politi policy advisor with an expertise on a range of topics, including natural ca capital methodology and accounting conservation finance and industrial policy. Prior to joining IUCN, Philip was head of the Global Public Goods Unit in the department in charge of economics with the French Ministry of Environment. In addition to leading the French assessment of ecosystems and ecosystem services, he worked closely on green economy and climate change issues, including innovative finance, links between trade and environment, and international governance on natural resources. Philip is currently on natural resource, natural capital accounting in working on natural capital accounting in Gabon, which he is going to talk about today. Over to you, Philip. Thank you very much, Evelyn, for the nice introduction and good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to present uh, briefly the work that IUCN is doing to develop natural capital accounts in Gabon with the support of ONF International. This project is funded by AFD, the French Agency for Development. The IUCN is implementing the project in partnership with WWF France and WWF Gabon. The, the, project, the project was launched last October we started with a workshop organized in Libreville in order to list the, the questions which are relevant to for policymakers. We met with officials, including the ministerial department in charge of statistics and national accounts to define the objectives of the project. We have understood that developing natural capital accounts is not enough. We must link these accounts to the needs of policymakers. We have to link, to link numbers and narratives. So we tried to discover what concerns the public and private decision makers. We, we have identified several key questions. For instance, how could we support the minister in charge of the environment when he has to negotiate for budget allocation? How could we support the conservation policy regarding especially protected areas and threatened species? So the, that, that questions are not only about numbers and figures, but uh, also about the narrative. Gabon has a very rich natural capital with a rich biodiversity, important water and wood resources. Natural capital is seen as a potential source of income for the country, especially for the development of uh, ecotourism. Next slide, please. This slide is about the story of the goose that laid golden eggs a very sad story, actually. The farmer had a goose. The goose was laying golden eggs. So he, he thought that uh, there was a treasury in the goose and he killed the goose. Poor guy. Natural capital, like the, the goose, is like the goose. Natural capital provides flows of goods and services, the, the golden eggs, and is a source of income. So, so the question is, uh, are we improving or degrading natural capital in Gabon? Are we killing the goose? Next slide. Yes, to, thanks. To, to address the question, we use the methodology published by the Secretariat of the CBD and called the ENCA for Ecosystem Natural Capital Accounts, the, the same method uh, presented by Arsene. This method is easy to implement, quick and low cost. And because the problem is about data, this method can be adjusted to the available data that we have. The method provides four accounts, a land account, a carbon account, a water account, and an ecological infrastructure account. For each account, we have table 
figures and maps. So we don't uh, just have, for instance, the tons of carbon sequestrated uh, by forest, but we also have information about where is the stock and how the stock is evolving between two dates. Next, next slide, please. Here is, for example, the map showing the ecological infrastructure account with a specific focus on the changes between 2000 and 2010. On this map, the red areas are showing where ecological infrastructure are being degraded. The green areas are showing where ecological infrastructures are going better. We can see that most of the map is in yellow that shows the stability of the status of the ecological infrastructure in Gabon. This is consistent with other indicators. On the left, we have the red list index calculated for Gabon, showing the, the relative stability of species survival in this country. In addition, we can see areas in red in the north and in, uh, in, uh, in the south where human activities are developing. So we can, uh, we can see with this map that the, the methodology is consistent with other sources of data. Next slide, please. To complete these results, uh, we have mapped uh, the habitat of uh, three emblematic threatened species, gorillas in black, chimpanzees uh, in brown, and elephants in, uh, in gray. We have also mapped uh, the protected areas, uh, including uh, national parks, hunting reserves, and other categories of protected areas. Then we have assessed uh, the changes affecting the ecological infrastructure account uh, in, the habitats, uh, in the habitats of these uh, free species and in protected areas. Next slide, please. The, the results are quite interesting. Here, we can see that the habitat of the free species are a bit fragmented. This is what we can see on the, the left side, side of the, the slide. The graph on the right shows that the ecological infrastructure is being degraded in the habitat of each species. And the worst is for gorillas. That means that we have to be very cautious if we don't want to, to kill the goose. If the government wants to develop ecotourism based on emblematic species, it is necessary to develop conservation measures in the meantime. So the next question is uh, about the protected areas. Are the protected areas efficient measures? Next slide. We have mapped the different categories of protected areas, including uh, national parks, hunting reserves, etc. Then we assessed uh, fragmentation and the changes of natural capital values uh, in the different categories of protected areas, uh, as you can see on this slide. Next slide, please. On the graphs, you can see that fragmentation is lower in national parks than in hunting reserves, for, in, for instance. Uh, we, we have the, the national parks in, uh, in, in green and uh, the, the, the hunting reserves in, uh, in yellow, for example. National parks can be seen as efficient measures to limit fragmentation. We have quite uh, the same results with degradation of ecological infrastructures in the, on the right side of the, the, slide, the, side, the slide. The degradation is less significant in national parks than in other categories of protected areas. This result shows the, that conservation works. The key learning is that we can develop ecotourism. There is a huge potential in Gabon, but we need to be very careful with the development of infrastructure in order to limit fragmentation and degradation of natural habitat of species. Next slide, please. To conclude, uh, this natural capital country pilot uh, has confirmed that ENCA is an efficient tool to produce low cost and quick natural capital accounts. The results are relevant to address specific questions and can support decision making. It's really important for us to develop accounts uh, useful for decision makers. To finish, I would like to say thank you to all the colleagues involved in that project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philippe. Thank you for the excellent examples and the brilliant analogy.
Are we killing the goose? I will now uh, open the discussion to our audience, to our listeners, and uh, I'll start with uh, some questions that have been posed in the Q&A box. And uh, I'll make an effort to merge up most of the questions because most of them are similar. One is in, uh, one from Harriet and another from Najema. Uh, what are the lessons? Uh, what what do the panelists have examples of best practices in data sharing? And uh, if you could give as many examples as possible, and are, the opposite, are there opportunities for cross-country learning on natural capital accounting? And data and uh, data and mainstreaming of nature in economic policies. Uh, I think what we're looking, for, what they are looking for, is examples and best practices in, in data sharing. This is open to the panel, and uh, any of you could take up the question. I don't. Maybe I go ahead. I um just for so from my experience um and i uh look specifically at case studies there was a question about supply and demand driven i think with the scoping we try to make them very demand driven um by framing the research question together with local stakeholders with regards to data gathering um i my experience is that that's a very tedious uh, work since data also um, in the different authorities and administrations is really, really scattered, um, uh, sometimes only available on paper in, in very remote parts um, uh, of countries uh, where we sometimes work. Um, and um, another problem that I find, and this is maybe addressing it back to the scientific community that I'm also now kind of part of is that um, there tends to there is a tendency to hold on to data that's actually uh, valuable to many more people and uh, and I would uh, really like to uh, encourage everyone to, who has the ability to make the data publicly available to do that in a way that other can profit from that that's uh, I find that very frustrating sometimes but I don't have a solution and I think it's yeah it's one of the biggest challenges. Thank you, Ulka. Yes, Asan? Yes, I would like to add uh, something on the question uh, related to concrete example of uh, data sharing. Yes, in our case, our expectation is after when we will generate all this d data on NCA, on IMET, on uh, green listing, red listing, and uh, other ways to generate data, we will uh, get at them in regional observatories and these observatories are supposed to be free access at least for uh, west african countries but i think beyond so this could be a very strong way or a source of data that could help decision makers policy makers even uh, businesses to get information and again as we will work to transform this data in information and knowledge, all these information will also be sh publicly shared. And we think that this is a great way to let uh, policymakers be uh, sensitized to the need to transform our ways of production, our ways of consumption. Thank you. Thank you, Asan. Um, uh, there's a question here that is uh, being posed directly to Ronald, and uh, I'll, I'll match two questions that have been, that are similar on waste management. Um, and there's a question asking what, how, how have we addressed the weaknesses of solid waste management policy and enforcement on its impact on natural resources and human health? And uh, one, uh, one Tomohai said, the gracious is asking if they are, uh, if, if there's something being done to provide data in waste management. Ronald, would you um, thank want you. to take up that question? Thank you, Vivian. Thank you, um, 
our partners for asking that question. I want to begin with the one on waste management. There are quite a number of uh, initiatives on waste management, if I can give the Ugandan example. Uh, we have the National Environmental Management Authority in Uganda that coordinates environmental management issues in the country. It does collect data on waste management, which is published in the State of the Environment report. The urban authorities, including the Kampala uh, capital, capital City Authority, they also collect data on waste management. And there are quite a number of studies that have been done on waste management. So we have data on different waste profiles. However, I, 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 allow me to say that we need to do more to collect more data on waste management. Evelyn, remind me of the next question. What was the second question that you wanted me to look at? Evelyn, is there any other question you want me to look at? Uh, I think there's, there's a question that was raised by Abisha, but you answered it uh, on uh, what are the examples of uh, on how we had a, have applied natural capital accounting in our NDP3. I think okay. that you answered. Uh, maybe if you'd want to address it here as well. Okay. The National Development Plan, NDP3, is Uganda's development framework for the next five years. Now, this framework is to guide the development interventions at different levels. Now, look what natural capital in this framework as a key opportunity to be harnessed for social economic transformation. Natural capital issues are, gather, are, are captured in the goal and theme of NDP3, which looks at sustainable industrialization, inclusive growth, employment, and wealth creation. Uganda has a natural, uh, natural resource-based economy. It depends on natural capital to drive agro-based industrialization, the tourism sector. So these sectors are reflected in the national growing plan. If you look at the, monitor, the, the monitoring results framework of NDP3, it has natural capital indicators. It has sustainability indicators that are monitored from year to year to see how we are moving on natural capital. There is also, there are also strategic interventions captured in especially the environment, land, and the water resource program, where natural capital is one of the interventions that are um, looked at, and the strategic interventions on promoting natural capital use are captured in this. So our monitoring and resource framework has natural capital indicators. The challenge now is to get data to feed into these indicators on an annual basis, such that by the end of five years, we can know what progress we've made on natural capital. I thank you. Thank you, Ronald. Um, I have a few questions uh, directed towards Philip. Um, one, one is asking whether you could share the link uh, to the report that you had uh, spoken about in your presentation, and also what methodology was used. And also, there's another question as well on how did the national administrations in Gabon verify stock created first in the actual outcomes, outcome numbers of the created accounts? Philip? Uh, yeah, yes, thanks for the questions. I have shared the, the, the link to the, to the publication uh, about uh, ENCA, the methodology. Uh, the publication was, um, the, the document was published by the Secretariat of the CBD. Uh, so this is available online. Uh, okay. Then uh, I, I, um, I would like to say that the, the methodology, sorry. For the questions that we've had, uh, I'll encourage our panelists to, if possible, uh, answer most of the questions 
uh, as they come in on the Q&A box. Okay. I'll now turn to, uh, thank you so much, our panelists. I'll now turn to Mark and ask if you could uh, wrap it up. Thank you very much, uh, and a really interesting conversation. Um, I would really encourage you all um, that have taken part here today to go on to the website at the African Forum on GreenEconomy.com, where you'll find a lot more information about this topic. As you can see, we've already run sessions on water, agriculture, finance, infrastructure, and today on data. There's one more that we will be doing on the 1st of July, and that is how does all of this come back together to actually create the change that we need to see? And data is going to play an essential part in that, as we heard today. So thank you once, once again to all of our speakers and to Evelyn for hosting in such a wonderful way. Thank you, and we'll speak to you all again soon. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.